Things were great. So, uh, yeah, I hope you guys are in awe on the controversy that we just heard. I mean, I'm just shocked. Uh, the uh, differences in market recognition of upcycled uh, materials. Uh, but I think we all can agree on that we have opportunities to grow this uh, this, this this category, this segment of the market. Um, Dan, you mentioned earlier, you know, kind of the the genesis or between regenerative maybe and adding in upcycled. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, with upcycled material, uh, as Amrit said, it's you know, mostly it's stack kind of categories around that. What do you think we need to do to maybe push that story farther upstream to talk about regenerative, you know, on packaging or on websites about you know agriculture. So if it's you know if it's a regenerative farm that's producing the the wheat that later on or you know the barley that gets spent. I mean, how do you think maybe we should push the story farther up? Yeah, well, or can I, or, we, or, no, we were, or was we, were, we we can. I was initially at a bit of a loss because there's actually some updated examples um, from what we're seeing in the market that I think would be would be relevant to share. With the group around new category creation and, and, and true innovation. So if I completely agree is what needs to happen for upcycle foods to take off. This is should not be a way to do a, a trendy rebrand of what's already happened in business as usual, but it should be a tool for the novel, you know, creation of, of, of new ingredients. And so um as, as it relates to regenerative ag and, and upcycling coming together, I mean, the idea that I've been dreaming of putting together just a fun one, and I don't know how scalable it actually is. Um, I was actually talking to the gentleman from Sustainagrain at, at lunch about this. Would be to work with a work with a, a bakery that has used um, you know upcycled grains to to, to make the, to make the bread uh, to then use the surplus from that to work with a, a brewery, you know, who can, uh, you know, use that to turn that back into beer and then we'll take that, we'll turn it back into bread again, circle the loaf, right? That'd be a lot of fun. Um, but I should note, you know, companies like, like Toast Ale, you know, their sites are set bigger than just, just beer. They've actually, uh, are now transitioning into a B2B space where they're developing basically a, like an upcycled, uh, alternative to conventional malt made from spent breadcrumbs. And they're now selling this as an ingredient to enable other breweries to do it. And so, you know, I think what we're seeing is what's typical for a new category where, yes, there's some bits and starts and some innovations that work and some innovations that aren't really innovations at all. And, you know, others, you know, that work and you, and you, you move, you know, onward and upward as, as, as we like to say in it, um, even just to address like the example of take two, take two foods, you know, they're actually a subsidiary, they were a subsidiary of Anheuser-Busch, which are actually of, of CX Ventures, which is a subsidiary of Anheuser-Busch, which is, uh, it also has evergreen, which is still a, a prominent ingredient player in this space. And it was a, a use case for, for evergreen. They've actually not spun that off. And there's another entrepreneur that's taking that project forward. You know, that's, uh, so I think there's just a lot of, there's a lot of uh, activity, you know, in a, in a market as it's, as it's starting to take, uh, to take, to take its shape. But I, I do think the most exciting opportunities are when we're taking raw materials that were conventionally overlooked and processing them in new and exciting ways to unlock that nutrition and that functionality and bring it full circle into, you know, into product development for the creation of, you know, new, new types of foods, you know, new categories, even as an input into, you know, precision fermentation processes to create, uh, you know, alternative proteins. I mean, this is, we're really just at the, the beginning of what's, of what's possible here. And um, I'm, you know, despite there being some failures in the, in the market, you know, there's also a lot of successes and I think, you know, a lot of uh, opportunity ahead. Great, great. And um, I mean, Angie, we we're supposed to talk about the uh, roles of standards. Um, you mentioned um, the greenhouse gas calculation and you're on your version 2.0 of the standard. Um, what we see in the market in many standards, is there's this whole idea of, you know, carbon calculation, greenhouse gas reduction, carbon insetting. Um, it, are you guys looking at the future? I mean, I would imagine that if you are, you know, bypassing landfill, right? There is a, literally there's a carbon uh, value that that material would have gone through. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, um, the, the type of breakdown of material, but essentially, you know, it exudes a lot of CO2 value that now that you're using it, you know, is that something that you guys are looking at in the future? Because if you have a baseline, and you can calculate a savings, then I imagine it would be the next kind of iteration of the standard. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think impact measurement is something that we will continue to look towards and evolve on, and it will be really necessary, especially as companies get more sophisticated in their own life cycle assessments um, at the product level. Um, on the one slide that I shared, it, it showed that 60 to 70 percent of emissions are coming from consumer products. Now, that can include durable and non-durable goods, which presents a big opportunity to target carbon emissions at that product level. There's a lot, there's a proliferation of like different frameworks and methodologies to do that. I think there needs to be some harmonization to be able to do it in a way that is um, credible and replicable across uh, different frameworks and, and certifications. And so we're really keeping an eye on how those continue to evolve um, and how we can bring those into the certification. And also as um, UFA, as the association, how can we also offer um, carbon accounting as a service to membership um, as they're also making decisions about which products they want to choose for certification and where they can have the biggest impact um, something that we also talk about a lot. And do you guys have a, um, are you agnostic as to the type of calculation that they, they need to have a calculation on their emissions, but yeah, right now we don't, we're not prescriptive um, in the standard and it is still um, demonstrating intent um, just because carbon calculations are quite costly and to the point that this is a new and growing category, there's definitely a lot of startups, smaller companies who quite frankly just don't have the revenues yet to even invest at that level. Um, and so using proxy calculations or tools like the food and uh, food loss and waste protocol. Uh, so that way they can provide some baseline of what they estimate their impact to be is something that we look for in the standard right now. Do you want to mention the food waste reduction aspect of the standard too? Yeah, I mean, you can give some insight into going through that. Um, but the, the food waste assessment is a critical component of the standard. And what that does is it forces the entity to really look at where food loss and waste is happening in their supply chain so they can target areas for reduction. And I think it's a really great galvanizing force inside of an operation. It gets everyone on the same page, provides them the tools to talk about it, um, and really changes sort of, it starts to shift like the worldview within your organization, which is ultimately what we want to do. Um, ultimately, we want people to be thinking about waste as an opportunity, as something to reduce, and as something to innovate with versus uh, something that just needs to go away. Yeah, and I think also importantly, it helps make sure that products that are getting certified as upcycled aren't wasting food in the process of exactly. pursuing yeah. upcycling food, right? And so I think, you know, carbon being a really important measure for sure. And there's, as a company that's gone through the certification, you, you have source identification and signal that you're going to, you know, pursue you know, ensuring that your products are creating that benefit. Um, one thing that I really like about the standard is that it core to the mission of the Upcycle Food Association is reducing food waste. And so there's a there's all, there's a verification step around food waste reduction plans within an operation that's pursuing that certification too. So I think that's as a yeah it's really a, a tool to build efficiency in your own operations or identify problems on your own product line. Um, I heard a story about some a bagel producer who kept getting those baseball bagels where the the center was collapsed and that was causing food waste because they had to throw them out and couldn't sell them and they were trying to upcycle those bagels um, but by working with um, a technical advisor they were able to identify that actually their product line was going too fast and so it was causing the bagels to be squished and so just by slowing it down they actually had less waste in their supply chain so those are the types of opportunities too that I think the food waste assessment can help you figure out when in your internal operations as well. Great. And Armitage, one of the things we, we also talked about is the messaging, you know, on, on package messaging, whether it's the upcycle symbol uh, and, and many other industries, we also see different tools. That, so in some of your research, have you seen companies that are using like QR co codes to try to better tell the story about, you know, where the material is coming from? Not, you know, using the language we said before about, you know, you don't want to call it waste, whatever, but are there examples that you've seen that companies are using Sort of that storytelling? Not QR code. Um, well, let me go back to my presentation. You know, when I gave the slide about business failures, um, maybe I could hinted it a little bit too negative. Um, this market is growing from almost nothing. And you probably had maybe 20, 30 operators 10 years ago. You've got over 200 operators now. 
um, I think over a hundred just here in the USA who about, about finished products, not just ingredients. So, you know, this market is growing. But the key point I want to say is just by up having upsides with products, that's no guarantee of success. And that's why I wanted to highlight those examples. So we are seeing more and more operators coming in. There is quite a lot of innovation. There's some very good products, but upcycling is not a guarantee of success. That was a key point I was going to say. Now, in terms of QR codes, we're not seeing that. Um, what, what we've seen in Europe is more and more artisanal brands, more and more brands marketing their products as sustainable. For example, in France, there's a lot of brands which are doing organic and upcycled products. And I think maybe this is the way to go. Right? So, uh, we talk about regenerative, we talk about circularity, but maybe we need to look at products which are not just marketed and upcycled, but they need to be organic, or they need to be fair trade, or they need to have some other sustainability attributes like nutritional aspect. And I think that's going to be the way forward. Yeah, I just have something to add there too, because I, I think it's important to note that regardless of the sustainability attribute you're using on your product, you are still competing on every other um, consumer preference also, right? Price, does it taste good? Does it look good on shelf? Is it where I shop? And so that isn't, like it's not unique to upcycling that these products might be more costly um, or that they'd also need to taste good. So that's true with fair trade. I can point, I can point to hundred, like a hundred examples of fair trade failures or organic failures. And so I think just the fact that we're so early in the market um, and there's a lot of this experimentation that is happening, those failures can look bigger than they actually are as symptomatic of the, the movement at large. And then the last piece is um, a lot of the large scale, uh, you know, multinational companies or retailers innovating in private label, their innovation timelines are two years to three years out. So they're starting now because they're seeing the starter companies, the startups and the innovative companies doing this and getting a lot of the consumer attention. And so now they're like, oh, hey, now we need to catch up. Oh, I want to start the certification process now, but it's not going to launch until 2025. And I think that's when we'll start to see more mainstream, more staple products um, and, and have more products that are definitely going to have staying power, especially in the private label area. Well, and I think, you know, I was here, you had a conference here, I guess, maybe five, six years ago, uh, and it was about food waste, you know, so now fast forward, you know, upside for food, you know, having 260, I believe, companies you mentioned, you know, that's, that's an incredible growth. Uh, I would like to see where we will be in a year from now or two years from now. Um, so maybe I open it up to the audience. Are there are questions for the panelists. Come on, don't be shy. Okay, over here. Hi, um, so most of the products that were mentioned in, in all of these talks were uh, pertaining to retail customers. And so I'm curious about the potential of selling to uh, restaurants. Have you looked into that? And is that something that the, the Upcycle Food Association is uh, working on? Is, is this a potential for growth? Yeah, the short answer is definitely. Um, a lot of the member companies that we work with, especially if you're working in beverage space or spirits, they are already selling into the food service channel. Um, there's certainly education that is needed at that level so that way people in the restaurants are equipped to sell those products and attribute them properly on, on, a, on a menu. Um, but we're definitely seeing more of that. We're also seeing the, the standard actually allows food service uh, restaurants and entities to certify products, like menu items that they might be producing with upcycled um, foods and ingredients as well. Yeah, and then on the commercial side of the spectrum, you know, I think it's important to acknowledge that one of the consequences of the, of the pandemic was an incredible strain on the food service industry, right? And what we saw was a big, a real slowdown in or a, a cessation entirely of innovation during a time when upcycled foods as a movement was really catching on in, in a retail environment. And so what we're seeing now is an increase in interest in the food service and, and restaurant world. And we're working with, uh, you know, commercial producers of things like par-baked and frozen doughs that can be sold into a, you know, to a restaurant environment that can also save labor in addition to bringing you know, upcycled into the menu and on the kind of higher end of the spectrum, even, uh, 
you could walk into Blue Bottle Coffee today around here and they've got a Cascara Fizz on the on the menu. Uh, Starbucks has had Cascara on the menu before. So, you know, I think uh, food service is behind in large part because of just the struggles brought by the by the pandemic, but we're gonna see a real acceleration in the next couple of years and you actually have a much shorter development window to get something from concept onto a onto a plate than you do from you know, concept onto a shelf, right? So it's um, excited about what's coming in that arena. But it also depends upon the products too. You know, we've seen a lot of the spirits which are made uh, from say beer, et cetera, they're being sold more in the food service stuff. It's because you know, consumers, when they when you go to a cafe, you go to a restaurant or somewhere like that, it's a novelty effect. And also, you know, a lot of craft beers, for example, uh, you can find more in the food service outlets than the retail. So uh, one company comes to mind, I think it's in Japan, it's called the Ethical Spirits Company, and they're using spent grains to produce sake, but they're only selling in food service. And I think the sparkling water, because it's a lot more expensive, you're not going to find, I think, the Australian botanical brand, which I gave an example, you're not going to find in retail, only in restaurants. So I think it also depends on the products. And food service is great to justify the price premium, because when you go to a restaurant, you go to a cafe, you're not going to compare it with other products on the shelf. Uh, one more thing, if you want to see an extreme example, for those of you who aren't from San Francisco, or those of you who are and may not be familiar with this restaurant, there's a, it's called Shuggies. it's in the Mission, and the entire Mission District, the, the entire restaurant is themed actually around food waste reduction. And it's a it's like a really cool kind of hipster, you know, restaurant. Um, so that uh, while you're in town, maybe check that out. That's super. I, I think you had a question in front. No? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, it was noted on the slide, uh, in the previous slide, that 61% uh, of consumer upcycled goods were from the beverage market, and we've seen samples from AB InBev, the, the ethical uh, beverage company. Is that a regulatory thing? Is that just or streamlining of uh, uh, materials? And why is it set up so heavily skewed towards beverage? Um, yeah, the presentation was from mine, and um, when we did our analysis, we did North America, we did Europe, and then we did the rest of the world. Yeah, you're not seeing so much upcycled beer. If you look in Europe, the European market, I believe beverages is by far the biggest sector, and it's upcycled beer. You know, you've got Coast Ale, I'll give an example of the beer, the Brussels Beer Project. There are so many companies in Europe which are making upcycled beer from bakery products. And then you've got these carbonated drinks. I'll give you examples of crust here in the USA, watermelon water, sparkling water from, um, they're doing some exciting stuff. Like uh, Asara Rasi, they're using the sap from a maple tree, which would no, not even go to the food industry. It's actually the, the timber industry. They're getting raw material, waste ingredients from the timber industry to make drinking water. So we're seeing a lot of innovation there. But I think beverages is fairly easy. You know, you can make things like juices, you can make beer, you can make spirits, carbonated drinks. So there's a lot of variety of products that you can make. And that's why we see that as number one. Thank you. There's a lot of really interesting dialogue going on here. And um, what we're just talking about with the restaurant industry or food service, do you think part of its success might be that there's like a dialogue rather than story one of ability when you're face to face with someone mm -hmm. saying, this is where this comes from versus like a grocery store and someone has to try to read a package, take the time where it had to catch their eye. Have you seen any data behind like it doing well because of that reason or the story one component? I, I can get I can draw an analogy from say other sectors that we've done research in and um, organic and fair trade, they had a very similar problem 20 years ago. Um, a company would launch organic and fair trade tea and the price would be doubled, sometimes three times higher than conventional tea. And then they'll go to retailers, they'll knock on their doors and they say, it's a great product, what's the price? And they would just run away. But then they made inroads in the food service sector. And uh, I don't know if any of you have taken the Euro tunnel, uh, the Euro tunnel, the train which goes from Paris to London. And it was a brand called Clipper. And Clipper was an organic fair trade brand of tea. It's now owned by um, Ecotone, a Dutch company. But anyway, they managed to get into the Eurotunnel. So if, whenever you took that train, 
you only had one choice to take, and it's clever. And the reason was when you're going, taking a speed train, or you're going on an aeroplane, or you're going to a cafe, premium cafe, price doesn't always matter. So sometimes food service can be a better outlet than retailers mm. because you're offering a premium product, there's a story behind it, and consumers are willing to pay a bit extra, you know, because they're not traveling every day or every week. It's once an occasion, and it's a great way to build distribution. Yeah, I, I love that answer, but also to, but to add in a um, another side to it, if you think about high-end high restaurant environments where you have that high connect point, yes, there is that storytelling, but in general, you know, like fast casual, things like that, you know, just anecdotally from talking to some operators, I know there's been some questions as to how exactly to tell that story on a menu, whereas with a bag of crisps, you've got a lot of, you've got physical real estate, right? You got to get the, you got to get the consumer's attention, get them to pull it off shelf. But which which actually has more storytelling opportunity at scale? I don't I, I don't know. It's an interesting question. I think. Other questions for Pam? Gentlemen up front, and then we'll do. Uh, Kyle Oliver from Bar Valley Acres. I was curious. I know there was on one slide that it said about sixty percent of people are willing to pay more for it. Um, but then one of the big challenges is the premium price point. So I was curious if there's been any studies or looking into at what point basically price the product out of the market and people are willing to pay that premium point. Yeah, well, I can just say anecdotally from our membership, it's going to depend a lot on the category that you're in and then the other attributes of your product. So, I mean, Dan probably has like a good example from, from his category, but I, I don't know that there's like one singular answer for that. Um, but I know that a lot of companies are trying to position themselves under the premium threshold. So they're right on the line there. So that way they can appeal to that premium customer who often tend to be very loyal and they want to try again, but also sort of stretch into other pocketbooks as well. I would just add that there's also always that um, kind of human psychological, you know, aspirational way that people answer surveys, right? And their indication to pay. And then you pair that with uh, the fact that there's also probably a selection bias in the market of most products that are launching are more premium market, more premiumly marketed products. So I just don't know that there's actually good data truly yet um, to answer that empirically. Uh, in the organic food industry, this survey was done 20 years ago, 10 years ago, and the question was always, if there were more organic products available, would you be willing to pay a premium? And consumers nearly always said yes. And a lot of the retailers actually launched the products, but consumers would not buy them. So there's always a disconnect between consumer intent and actual purchase. So whether it's organic, whether it's another great example that they used in the organic food industry was asking smokers how many smokers want to give up smoking more than 90 percent would say yes but how many would actually give up so there's always a disconnect between what consumers say and what they actually do i think there's time for one last question hi um thank you all for your talks i find this topic really fascinating and i think all the work you're doing is is very cool and important um, but I kind of want to bring the conversation back to um, agricultural waste. Um, I, in my role, I work really closely with farmers and uh, living in the Central Valley where it's like it's an agricultural center. Um, we see a lot um, that it happens a lot where farmers either due to um, some climate event or you know, disease outbreak, or even you know just the fact that um, their yields aren't very good, they decide that it's not even worth their time or money to even harvest their field at all that year. And so I'm kind of, I don't really, my question is, are those food losses being counted in like the amount of food produced that is wasted and is that a uh, source of food loss being uh, talked about in the, in the food waste opportunity? Yeah, sure. Yeah. 
Awesome question. Really important issue. Definitely being talked about a lot there. Um, it is measured to the best of the ability that Refit has to, is, you know, if they get the, the data right from the, from the ground and sometimes that type of information may be underreported. Um, but there, and there's also a lot of innovation in the nonprofit and NGO world of food recovery and redistribution, where there are you know solutions being implemented in different regions to come in and you know, basically do a scaled up version of gleaning, right? And, and those types of scenarios. I mean, I'd love to see it where it's creating shared value, right, with the, the growers. Um, and I think there's a big gap in infrastructure around regional processing, you know, about regional value added processing that could solve this. Like some of these ideas are not new, like turning ugly fruits and veg into, into juice. I and mean, ju that's what juicing grade, canning grade, you know, decades ago, or right now you've got apples that are grown expressly for the purpose of being juiced. Right? And so it's changed the market, especially for mid or small size you know, growers. Um, but yeah, so with, you know, I, I think and there are some examples of these investments in regional like food sheds and processing centers to kind of seal the seasons you know, locally. But I would look in the, in the refed, uh, not just the, the food waste monitor for the quantification of that information, but also in the innovator database, especially in the nonprofits that are doing uh, recovery and redistribution for uh, some solutions that might be of interest. Yeah, and I, I would just add, you know, stick around for the discussion with Imperfect Foods, um, who will talk about sort of like their model for rescuing these sorts of like potentially damaged products or um, and then, you know, definitely food rescue organizations. I, I have definitely seen a proliferation of those in the last like five years, it seems, or at least they're, they're more visible. Um, the other part around sort of like on-farm losses that excites me and is really related to upcycling are trimmings from things. So imagine a cauliflower head that you're cutting off the leaves and the stems, and that's just going into a pile that is like composted. There are companies looking at those trimmings and identifying opportunities for new products. And so I think that is another area where I see farmers in particular being able to um, sort of uh, catch some of the value in the supply chain as well. And just one point there, I think we should look outside the food industry. If you look at the personal care industry already, and just to give an example, palm oil, um, majority of the oil produces from the palm fruit, but the palm kernel, which is not edible, is used by the cosmetics industry as, um, as an oil. And the same thing with a, a lot of ingredients like, say, plum kernels, uh, apricot kernels, etc. So a lot of the waste materials already in the food industry are used by the personal care industry. So maybe we're going to see more cross-industry use of these upcycled ingredients. It's not just the food industry, it's maybe the personal care industry, it could be the home care industry in terms of detergents, etc. And I think this is how the industry is going to evolve because we can't eat everything which is a waste. We can't always valorize the waste in terms of food, but those nutrients can be used for other products and other industries. Well, I, I think, Bob, do you want to add a second question? Well, just for the, the, the sake of time, I think we've, we've prepped a bit, uh, but join me, please, in thanking our panelists. It was great, great. Thank you. So now we move to the network break, uh, which we will be.